All right, good morning. Thank you all for being here. I am Brandi Guthrie, the 2017 president of the Austin Board of Realtors. And today we're bringing the ABOR Forum, Real Estate is Global, What Does It Mean for Your Business? We hope that this forum will provide you with impactful information about international buying and selling here in the Austin and Central Texas marketplace. Before we begin our program, I'd like to introduce Marjorie Tunnell with Independence Title, who is our ABOR Forum affiliate sponsor. Let's welcome Marjorie. Thank you, Brandy. So how many of you in this room know what the acronym FERPTA stands for? Oh, a few of you, great. But I would say the majority of us in this room probably don't. Like Brandy said, my name is Marjorie Tunnell. I'm with Independence Title. I'm head of the education department and we're happy to be able to sponsor your event today. What a great topic you all have chosen to gather to talk about, global real estate. I'm a native Austinite and let me tell you, Austin is becoming more and more global each day. So the reason we chose FERPTA as a topic is because it does stand for the Foreign Investment Real Estate Property Tax Act. So we figured that had a little bit of connection to global real estate. Not many of you may know that every single transaction, almost every single one, not every single one, but almost every single transaction that Independence Title closes, we have to report to the IRS. And if you have a foreign seller that is not a US citizen, then it's really hard to report that transaction to the IRS. So I wanna call your attention to a handout that you have in your chair there. And the, you'll see that the first thing we've put is the contract paragraph having to do with FERP debt. I'm just gonna take a few seconds to read this to you because I think it's important to see exactly what it says. If seller is a foreign person as defined by applicable law, or if seller fails to deliver an affidavit to buyer that seller is not a foreign person, then buyer shall withhold from the sales proceeds an amount sufficient to comply with applicable tax law and deliver the same to the Internal Revenue Service together with appropriate tax forms. Internal Revenue Service regulations require filing written reports if currency in excess of specified amounts is received in the transaction. So there's a couple of key words in that paragraph that I want to call your attention to. The first one is shall. And those of you that have been in any contract class with TREC know that shall means must in TREC language, right? <laughs> we all know that. The other thing I want to call your attention to is the fact that it is the buyer's responsibility to get this done. Which you might be thinking, why in the world is it the buyer's responsibility? It's the seller that's not a US citizen. But if we stop to think about it for just a second, the buyer is gonna be the owner of this property after the transaction closes. If the IRS finds out that there was a transaction where that property was sold and they didn't get a piece of their pie, they're gonna be most likely placing a lien on that property. So now your buyer has an IRS tax lien on their house. Not a good way to start your home ownership journey, right? So we don't want that to happen. So there are some bullet points down at the bottom of things you can do as agents to prevent this from happening. Listing agents should always confirm if your sellers are US citizens when the listing agreement is signed. You can easily use our listing appointment checklist form, which we also gave you today, to easily gather this information. Blame it on the title company if you don't feel comfortable asking. Say, hey, the title company has to know about your citizen status and alert your escrow team immediately if your seller is not a US citizen and consider adding a note in MLS if you know that your seller is not a US citizen so that any buyer's agents involved in your transaction will realize that and realize that their buyers are then going to have to coordinate with the CPA how to get this reporting done. So that being said, if you represent buyers, you should confirm the citizen status of the seller with the listing agent if the seller is not a US citizen, you need to connect your buyer with a CPA familiar with FERPTA. And I can't stress enough the familiar with FERPTA part because not many CPAs, believe it or not, really know what FERPTA is. And so if you call your favorite CPA and go, hey, I need some help with FERPTA, and they go, well, what? Then say, oh, never mind. You know, and then let us know. We are happy to connect you with some CPAs that are very familiar with FERPTA, and they can determine just really in a matter of minutes if withholding applies. And if withholding does apply, then we are going to need to have that in written instructions. An email is fine. 
and we are going to actually do that withholding on the settlement statement, give your buyer a check payable to the U.S. Department of Treasury, to the IRS, and your buyer is going to submit that along with forms to the IRS. So we just wanted to bring this very important part of the contract that is sometimes overlooked to you today because, again, you may have that global investor that may not be a U.S. citizen selling and maybe purchasing some additional property with you, and this is an important part of that transaction. Again, thank you for – yes, you had a question. What kind of proof? What kind of proof? That they're not a U.S. citizen? If you have a social security number, then we're good. Yes, it, yeah, that's part of, the, yeah, if you have U.S. citizen, social security number, they're all sort of tied together. And there is even some exceptions to the rule of not being a U.S. citizen, but having a tax ID number that the CPA is going to determine that, you know what, we don't have to do withholding because we have a tax ID number and we can report that way. So just know that there are some exceptions to this rule. But I'm not a CPA, so I'm not going to, you know, tell you when it applies and when it doesn't apply. <laughs> Yes. If you have a way to the report to the transaction, then my understanding is that you would be okay in the, that transaction. To, if you had one spouse that was a U.S. citizen and one that was not. Great question. Yes. Yeah, I'm not familiar with what they do after the transaction. Do, that's a good point, though, that you brought up, that, that this withholding that takes place, and we gave you the IRS blurb on it there in the middle. If you have insomnia, go ahead and read that sometime. But um, it, it is approximately 15% of the, the proceeds, of the sales price, and just know that, you know, that 15%, they may get back. And, you know, from the IRS following the transaction after they've proved some things such as, you know, owner occupancy or different things that apply to the transaction. Yes. Any other questions I can answer? Okay. Yes, Jim. There it goes back to broker responsibility. Okay. All right, so just know that it, do, it does talk about that in the IRS code, that it talks about the agents involved. So, yeah, I just realize that there is some responsibility there. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for allowing us a few minutes to speak this morning and the ability to sponsor your event, and let's get started with the forum. Thank you, Marjorie, and thank you, Independence Title. It's with affiliate sponsors like this that we're able to have these forums and these great events, so we really appreciate you. Uh, we'd also like to take this time to recognize some of our leadership with our association. If you are a board of director for the Austin Board of Realtors, would you please stand and be recognized? If you are on the ABOR Foundation Board, please stand and be recognized. If you serve as an NAR Director, please stand and be recognized. If you serve for the state as a TAR Director, RVP, or a Tree Pack Trustee, please stand. And today we have a special guest with the TAR executive uh, leadership, COO Mike Barnett. Will you please stand to be recognized? <laughs> if you are a TRLP graduate, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> and last but not least, if you serve on the ABOR International Committee, please stand and be recognized. These are the individuals that were able to bring this programming to us today. So today we're going to be joined by five experts, and they are here to discuss an important industry topic about how international buying and selling affects you in today's marketplace. I'd like to introduce our speakers. First, Rob Hahn. 
Rob Hahn is the founder and managing partner of 70S Associates, a strategy consulting firm specializing in creative solutions rooted in strategic analy excuse me, analysis and data. With a varied background from finance, corporate law, technology, product development, media and entertainment, startups, fashion, and even as a professional card player, Rob brings a unique perspective to business problems. He started in real estate at a specialized commercial real estate investment firm investing in airplane hangers, true story. He moved on to Realogy where he headed the interactive marketing for Coldwell Banker Commercial. Rob writes the well-known blog, Notorious ROB, where he opines on topics in real estate, technology, marketing, and strategy, although they are too far along of posts. He is a prolific speaker at industry events such as Inman Connect, T3, local, state, and national events, as well as weddings and bar mitzvahs. <laughs> Somehow named to Inman most 100 influential people list, despite his best efforts not to be noticed, Rob understands that with great power comes great responsibility. Conversely, he notes that with very little power comes very little responsibility. Let's welcome Rob. And next, I would like to welcome Richard Miranda. Richard is a native San Juan, Puerto Rico, and a 36 resident, year resident at Houston, Texas. He's been a realtor since 2002. Richard earned his SIPs in 2003, TRL, TRC in 2005, TRLP 2011, CNE, SMP, AVR, and AHWD designations, and is currently actively pursuing his CCIM designation. Currently, Richard holds a broker associate position with Keller Williams Realty Greater Northwest and is the managing director for the commercial division at that office. He is the past chairman for HAR's International Advisory Group and TAR's International Advisory Committee. Currently, he serves as a director for both HAR and TAR and was recently elected as secretary treasurer for HAR. Congratulations. He's he is a member in good standing of the Mexican Real Estate Association known as AMPI and the Commercial Real Estate Network. He holds an MBA from Our Lady of the Lake University in San Antonio and has received numerous awards for being a consistent and recognized top producer and is in addition a Texas CE certified instructor, a certified SIPS instructor, and NAR's presidential liaison to Mexico. Let's welcome Richard. Next, we have Susie Kang. She has volunteered at ABOR, TAR, NAR, and CCIM for the last 10 years. She has also served in the past as NAR's presidential liaison for Korea for four years and the country liaison for Korea National Unification Advisory Council and served there for six years. She is from South Korea and has been actively involved in the Korean community, including relocating clients from Korea and other states. Susie takes great pride to help communities make a difference and is currently serving her second term as the director for the Austin Board of Realtors and currently serves as a TAR director. She was also instrumental in bringing forward the international committee here at the Austin Board of Realtors. Welcome, Susie. <laughs> Next, we have Jay Gohill, who is a broker and owner of Jay Gohill Realty in Austin and has more than 29 years of experience in the real estate industry. In addition to multiple levels of involvement in the realtor organization, Jay has served as zoning and platting commissioner appointed by the city of Austin mayor from 2003 to 2009. Currently, he's serving as the NAR board of directors. He has also held several positions in the Austin board of realtors, including chairman in 2009. Jay's outstanding work in the real estate industry has earned him several awards, including the Cultural Awareness Award from the Austin Board of Realtors and the National Association of Realtors Omega Tau Rho Award for his outstanding service to the industry and 2010 Realtor of the Year and the ABOR Chairman's Award in 2012. He has a deep history of service at local, state, and national level and is a graduate of the Texas Realtors Leadership Program, TRLP. In addition, he's serving as the Region 15 Vice President for the Texas Association of Realtors, where he serves as the association on the executive board and fulfills the important role communicating information between the state and the local association here in Austin. Let's welcome Jay.
Next, I'd like to welcome Rila Menengsaka. Rila is an engineer in training and a full-time realtor by choice. She was born, raised, educated, and had her first career in the Philippines. She has managed people, products, projects, and dollars for more than a decade in a few tech companies. Aside from Austin, Texas, Rila has lived in a couple of places, including Boise, Idaho, Folsom, California, and Chandler, Arizona. She knows and understands the challenges and excitement of moving and relocating, and she is especially cognizant of the cultural differences and the universal similarities. She speaks English, I'm gonna say this wrong, Tagalog, Filipino, and Ilocano. Rila is the current president of the Asian Real Estate Association of America in Austin, known as ARIA. Let's welcome Rila. Ladies and gentlemen, we did have another guest panelist today, Carol uh, Kyrus, who could not be with us today. Um, she had gotten injured uh, due to a fall of one of her elbows um, and had needed to have extensive surgery. Um, but we are happy to report that the surgery went well and she's also doing very well as an addition and she was very sorry she couldn't be here. Um, just to say a little bit about who she was or who she is, um, she has her, C her SIPS RCE and over 20 years in association management in the professional development and global. She's been at NAR for 13 years and is the managing director over the SIPS program. Also at home with diversity and the Global Business Council outreach and support. She will be offering uh, further committee training and that will take place with the NAR Associates a little later next week. So thank you, I'll turn this over to Rob. All right, thank you, Brandy. Can you all hear me okay? Do you need this? So thank you again for inviting me. Um, thankfully, my, um, as a moderator, on all of my crazy ideas and none of that needs to come out because you're not here to hear me talk actually on this topic. Uh, we have a wonderful panel. Um, just as a matter of logistics, we're gonna go to, through to about noon. So I'm gonna try and call for a break, you know, so we can go to the bathroom and take care of whatever because honestly, we're really fascinating. But you guys sitting in chairs and listening to us talk for an hour and a half might be a, a bit much of an ass. So we'll, we'll do a, a very short break. Now it's just sort of call for it. So. Let's start with just generally, why should I care question. In other words, I'm not involved in international real estate, right? I, why should I care? How big is this thing? How, how much of an impact does this really have? Maybe we'll just start from Richard and, and go on down. And I'll have some stats to ask about that as well. That's a great question. Can you hear me? One of the reasons that I decided to pursue the international market is because I in my previous life, I was already doing international uh, sales uh, and, 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 and representation with the previous employers that I had. So it was, it was kind of like the normal thing to do, just keep that momentum going. But the main thing is that for, for many of us who never had the experience to do international, we have to be aware that there's so many incoming buyers that are spending much more than the average domestic buyer. NAR stats suggest that the average buyer that comes from outside the United States spends an average of almost $150,000 more per transaction than our domestic counterparts. What does that do to our income? What does that do to our GCI? Right. And on top of that, half of them pay cash. What does that do to the closing time and the closing cycle? So those are the two primary reasons why I think that most of us should be aware that the incoming buyers that are buying properties here in the U.S. are really, they're for real, and it's a great opportunity to, to enhance your income and make more money. Texas is the third state for foreign investment, foreigners coming to U.S. to invest next to Florida and California, and we would not want to miss that opportunity even though you don't speak the, their mother language, you can always, you know, have a transactions. I'm sure most of you have done transactions with the foreign-born investors or even residents. So getting to know how we able should do in, in terms of uh, dealing with those international transactions, that's why you guys here. So we love to share that and we deeply care for this. That's why you guys here. 
So at the national level, um, at least for the Asian Americans, it's projected that in the next 30 years, um, the Asian American population is going to double from 21 million to double that. Now, locally here in Austin, um, the growth of the Asian American population has grown by 1.5% from 2010, about 6%, and more recently, about 7.5%. Do the math. If there's 2 million people here in Austin, that's 1.5% growth in the last six years. So there's a lot of opportunities in here. From the Asian American um, population standpoint, I'm sure there's other populations in there too that's growing in the same way. As we all know that in international investment is there for years and years. Uh, it's just a, a timing. Last 20 years, there are so many technology sector has opened it up. Each one was a big in 1992 and on. That has brought up really very high influx into international market as well. Jay, as, would you mind speaking more into the mic? As well as uh, uh, commercial side. Commercial side was always invested from outside investor, but it is getting more attention in last 20, 30 years because of a uh, uh, very uh, market is, as you all know, appreciating, you know, more than what they have paid, you know, 10 years, doubled it market. So it, it market from uh, that standpoint, people are uh, interested here. It's a little more safer than their own country. So it is becoming more and more uh, opportunity for international buyers. So what I'm hearing, Richard, is uh, the international uh, agent realtors of ABLE should probably pay more in dues because, no, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> um, we know that Texas actually is a pretty big uh, international destination. You know, I have a stat here saying, um, let's see, Texas, uh, da, da, da. Texas real estate report. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, it's um, something like 10 billion in Texas. Yep. Yeah, 10.26 billion in yep. Texas. Now, being that I am from Houston, which is you know really the truly global city in Texas, you know we look at it and go, yeah, I mean that's <laughs> nine billion or so probably coming to us. You know we go oil and gas, so it's you know everyone. But let's talk about Austin. I mean because we are in Austin, Austin border realtors. Fine, Texas is is this huge opportunity tons of international money coming into Houston. What about Austin? I mean, should the ABOR members, like what, tell us a little about international activity here in Austin, not just statewide or Houston that, you know, whether that's just, you know, your personal sort of take on things, what you're seeing, what, what are you seeing happening? Why should ABOR members care about international? Well, when you're looking at 10 million, uh, 10 million dollars that are 10 spent, billion. 10, 10 million. million. 10 billion, I'm sorry, yeah. 10 billion dollars that are spent by foreign buyers here in Texas. I mean, I can't tell you exactly how much in Houston and Austin and San Antonio and Dallas, but I can, I, I can pretty much safely say that of those uh, almost $10 billion that are spent here in Texas, most of them is gonna go to those four big cities. So let's assume that you're getting a good chunk of it. So $10 billion divided into the average price of a property here in Austin, which I know is higher than Houston, you can divide that by the amount of the average price and it'll tell you what the amount of transactions are. <coughs> so assuming that you can catch, say, five or 10 transactions, additional mm -hmm. transactions from those incoming buyers, whether you're in Houston or Austin or San Antonio or, or, or any other city, you are gonna catch additional um, amount of business that is gonna make an impact in your bottom line. So again, I cannot answer specifically how much of those 10 billion are going to Austin, Houston, but I can, I can, I can assume that we're getting, here in Austin, you're getting a pretty substantial chunk of that. Yeah, Austin being such a diverse city, as you know, Samsung is the number one private company that pays the largest amount of utilities in the city of Austin. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are many tech companies also, and a lot of international students at UT as well. So, and we, uh, we ABLE has formed the international committee 
three years ago, and this is one of a product of uh, what we have. And we have so many international um, buyers in Austin because of uh, their education for, for attending UT or a good school and people relocating from California or big major cities or even from India. Uh, Jay, you know. Susie, if you're talking to Mike. Yeah, India or even China, even Korea, even Philippines. They all come to Austin because of a good school systems. And as an Asian's point of view, school is the number one thing. A lot of Korean, I can speak about Koreans, a lot of Korean families separating it. Uh, husband work like a dog in Korea, and wife with the kids living in Austin, sending kids to the good school while wife plays golf during the day while kids gone. <laughs> But, but the parents still sacrifice their life. They think that that's the best life for them when kids grow up with a good education, PhDs. It's a totally different concept, but people still think that good education means a good, good life. And so and we have continued influx of foreigners coming to Austin. Again, we don't want to miss that opportunity to generate those incomes as a realtor. So um, there's a lot of buyers from different countries, but very significantly, a lot of them are coming from China. And as part of the Asian Real Estate Association, or ARIA, um, ARIA has a memorandum of understanding with the Chinese Real Estate Association. And next year, they want to come to Texas. And we're planning where that's going to happen. And they know Houston and Dallas. They don't know Austin very much. But we have a lot to offer. And I think that as an association, ABOR and ARIA and other organizations as well, maybe the Greater Asian Chamber of Commerce and maybe even the city of Austin can do something to attract um, this particular group of people, CREA, Chinese Real Estate Association, to come here to Austin. Because really it's not a, a big dot in their radar. And it's very important that if we want this big chunk of business here in Austin that we should attract them. Just to give you a perspective about uh, how Austin has grown up in Asian uh, uh, as a whole, in the international, I don't have other factors, but I can give you 2001 when I was chairman of Asian Chamber of Commerce, that time we had uh, Chinese, uh, Vietnamese, Japanese, uh, Indians, total was about 30 to 40,000 families in, in Austin. Now if you go and account, that is a triple or more than uh, a triple because of the, again, I mentioned earlier about the high tech influx and it is becoming uh, more like uh, Silicon Valley and as you all know, a few years back, we used to call uh, Silicon Hills, if you all remember. So that is becoming more and more popular in uh, Austin uh, as a uh, if you look at the, our, our uh, economy, if you all know that we were dependent on state years and years back, then we became a little more uh, closer to entertainment side, then we became a little more on our industrial and high tech side. Now adding to the fourth leg of the economy is becoming medical side and bio. So that makes a more stable, stable market for the Austin and a lot of professionals want to see stabilized markets. So you're going to be seeing more and more foreign influx in uh, in Austin than most probably any other in the state. Wonderful. All right. Uh, before we move on to sort of more specific, just to clarify, all of these international transactions, all these foreigners coming into Austin, we're not counting California, right? Because a lot of us <laughs> feel. Anyway. Um, so. 
I, I mean, I think it's obvious that this is a big market. This is a big deal, and we need to be paying attention to it. So let's, I'd like to just sort of have you guys walk through the transaction, like how it's different. I mean, I think everyone in the room understands how a real estate transaction goes, but starting maybe with buyers, uh, maybe I'll ask Susie to sort of take this one. What, what's different? You know, what's the process when you're working with an international buyer uh, in purchasing a, a home in the States? When you work with the international buyers, first of all, they don't speak English very good. That's not mean they don't know how to invest their money wisely. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, in Korea, we don't have a notary systems or we don't have a title companies. So for them, it's very kind of odd. Also, even though you don't have money in your bank for the last three months, they can still buy they can still put the money down by borrowing the money from your families and friends, getting guarantor forms signed. Therefore, it's very easy to buy houses. However, in Korea, you only allowed to buy one house per person, unless that is a commercial properties. Maybe that's one of the reasons that many Asians coming to US trying to invest in real estate, like China, you only own the 77 years. Pretty much it's like a ground lease. Afterwards, it goes back to the government. So you own only your real estate, even though you pay the full price for 77 years. Therefore, a lot of Chinese investors coming to US buy properties here because they will be owned by you and your kids or your grandkids forever. So this is a kind of good way of doing that. Um, for, for handling trend, international transactions, I had an incident that when client comes to Austin, submit the contract, of course I had a uh, power of attorney form signed. Then after they, they contract executed, they went back to Korea. So they don't have to come back to sign all the documents. Tata company will send the original documents to Korea to sign it. However, that those documents have to be signed in front of a notary, notarizer. We don't have a notar notary system. And then title company goes, well, you have to go to American embassy to sign them in front of them. Guess what? You have to wait for one month to just get in the door. So what do we have to do? So we went to a Korean attorney to have a sign in front of them and then have a Korean attorney notarize and they brought you know, FedEx, those original documents, guess what? Title company says, no, this is not allowed. It's not their system that, uh, you know, have Korean attorney sign it. So papers come back and forth, back and forth. Of course, it has to be original document. So if you don't have a power of attorney form signed, then you go through lots of hassles. So if you find that you dealing with the international clients with no social security number, Try to get those informations from the title company, see what title company wants. Each title company has different forms of dealing with those power of attorney form. As long as you have assigned by their own title company form, then they should be okay. Would you guys agree with that, Richard, Jay, Rela? I mean, power of attorney uh, usage? Yes, uh, it depends on what type of which country you are coming from. But uh, mostly in uh, foreign countries, they do not have a title uh, company's type of uh, settings or lawyers are not that much uh, involved in a real estate transaction for foreign transaction, basically. So you have to really be a patient working with an international buyer. Uh, it is uh, becoming more and more uh, popular for a lot of uh, uh, international buyer to come here and buy thinking that just they're going to spend a dollar and they'll buy a house. That's not really the case. As we all know, we have a lot of U.S. governmental rules uh, applies in there. Just we heard about FERPA as well as mortgage. You know, if he's looking for a, a mortgage, then he's going to have to go through some hassles and if he's coming with a cash, the uh, government is asking trail of that cash. As you all know, that there is a lot of uh, uh, foreign buyers don't have that kind of information. One other thing is some of them uh, 
acronym we use, HOA and on that, we need to really make, uh, train them in those kind of acronyms because they are not aware of, they have, they have never even, uh, even local, our, our international millenniums who <laughs> born here, they have a little information, but if you're coming from other countries and you are buying business here and also buying a house here, it is very difficult to train them in, in uh, uh, different, different fields and have to be a very patient with these folks. Uh, trust is very important in uh, bringing them in your side because they will uh, stay away from you for two to three weeks until they build up uh, really good trust and then they will open up, they'll talk about their mattress money and they'll talk about everything. <laughs> so, so it's kind of a, a, building a trust to, uh, coming up from an uh, international bank. Yeah, I, I do agree with, you know, being patient. It's just like um, dealing with a first-time home buyer. You have to educate them on what our process here in the U.S. is because from where they come from, there's a different way of doing things. There's what we call Asian accounting, which is the mattress <laughs> 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 that we have to deal with. And, you know, that has to be uh, taken into consideration in terms of, you know, the closing time as well. The biggest challenge that we have when we're working with foreign buyers is educating them. And it's not just telling them what's going to happen because every buyer wants to know what's going to happen. It is a process. It starts with when, I, when I'm dealing with a foreign buyer, the first thing that I ask for them is some time that we sit down and we meet. We have a face-to-face -face conversation. We go through a, the process. We go through an expectations conversation. I tell them what they need to do. I tell them what's going to happen or what we think is going to happen. But the process starts with that, and it is not just telling them, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to be doing. This is what can happen if we do this, this way, or this other way. So the process, that, that initial conversation that I have with my foreign buyers, sometimes it takes two hours. Mm -hmm. However, it will save me so much grief and so much pain in the back end because they will know what they expect from me they know what to expect from the system, from the process, because they don't have any clue that doing business here in the United States in, in, in terms of real estate transactions is so different than where they're coming from. From the, the most basic difference, I mean, they don't have lock boxes. They don't have, they don't have representation agreements. They have no idea what an agency of representation is. We've got to explain that to them so that they understand that we work for them, not for the seller. So that is, the, in, my, in my view, the hardest thing and the biggest challenge when you're working with these foreign buyers is to sit down and have a, an education conversation and start the process having a, a sit-down conversation and expectations conversation with them. But let me take you guys back to the very, very beginning, okay? Let's say somebody in this room says, you know, that, looks, that sounds amazing. $10 billion, Austin's growing, great. I want to get into this. How do you even go about getting contact? How do you do lead gen when we're talking about international buyers? And quite frankly, here's the issue, Susie. Like, for example, you know, maybe you have a bunch of contacts and sphere from being a Korean immigrant. If someone in the audience is not, what do they do? How do they go about getting international buyer lead gen to begin with? Even though you don't speak their language. Mike, please. Even though you don't speak their language, um, if you get involved in the community, for example, if, if you are interested in Chinese investors, which they are the most investors in, in, in Asian countries, if you get involved in Chinese associations, there are many activities going on. Show up there, even though you don't speak Chinese, they usually speak in English. So talk to them and get to know them. In Asian culture, it takes a lot longer to get to know them but once you get to know them, they will do anything for you. They will continue to generate the leads uh, or even referrals for you. Sometimes it calls American way annoying, in in Asian way caring, okay? Because that's that's their way of caring, but it's too much. And asking how old are you, uh, how many kids do you have, and are you single? I wanna I wanna introduce you to somebody else. 
it's it, 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 it's they think they trying to own your life to sh to show caring, but again, it's annoying in an American way. Um, <laughs> so you have to politely, you know, politely and denying say, hey, I can handle myself, blah blah. Um, it's a <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's challenging, but, um, but again, it takes time. Anything when you have clients, it takes time to get to know them. Um, as a Korean native speaker, I have a little bit of an advantage to get involved in the Korean community. Um, also do a lot of uh, voluntary work and anybody in any organizations, when you do voluntary work, they welcome you with the open arms because you know they don't have to pay you, right? So it, it's it's a free labor, pretty much. So they love you regardless of what you do, and that's the way how you get to know them. Once you get to know them, they see how sincere you are, how how genuine you are, then you will get referrals from people. Once you do a good job in one person, and then they say, hey. Suji does job that is, you know, with the responsibility and accountability. Once the words go out, then people start to refer and they find. And in, in my case, we have a Korean uh, weekly newspapers, and uh, I do publish some articles related to the real estate, that how consumers not do or should do kind of stuff. So some consumers read those articles and understand, okay, this is what's going on, and then they ask questions. Uh, also, another way of getting good leads would be getting, getting designations. Like a CIPS designations one for international clients because CIPS is organized by NAR. They offer uh, big, big, huge, thick yellow pages, and your name obviously there with what language you're speaking. So you get to also leads from CIPS. Uh, of course, CRS and CCIM is one of them that for commercial clients that you get leads. So get involved in the, their community, or if you are European client that you want to get involved in it, then go visit their country to, 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 um, to show up at the, their conferences. Even though I don't speak French, um, I, I showed up to their, you know, conferences that is one of the biggest uh, European conference like NAR in US and I showed up there and everybody was welcoming me and I was speaking on behalf of a Korean associations that time I was a president liaison for South Korea and NAR for four years so and you get to know them then you have a lot of leads coming from that so get involved in a community, and that's a very good way of getting leads. You said Sorry. something that I want to sort of follow up with the other panelists. You mentioned the Korean language newspaper, and I know for Koreans that's a big deal, right? Is that sort of sort of is that also the same in other communities as well? Yes, uh, that is uh, kind of becoming a grouping of. Uh, just give you an example of India. As you all know, there is a 14 different uh, languages and 14 different uh, religious way of doing the business. So, and those folks have a, right now in Austin, I remember 20 years ago, we had only one newspaper. Now you have a 30, 40 news, different, different newspapers with different, different small association. One is South Indian, and then you have a three, four under, South Indian, then North Indian have a two to three different uh, and religious temples and all that. If you look at that, it's a wild, wild west there, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, and and with go with that, give you a good example of feng shui. As you all know, that feng shui it was used to be look like a, a all a one size fits all type of things. That's not the case. That is a really misnomer because if you know feng shui, that's not going to take you anywhere. You've got to know which side of the Indian community you are working with. If you're working with the North Indian, they have a completely different concept of the, uh, uh, Vastu. Uh, 
So that kind of uh, things you have to learn from their community association, just like Susie mentioned. You ought to be involved with them to understand. And once in a while, you know, you will hear from one client says, I like a north facing. So as we know, we all going to go say, I got to sell this Indian north facing. That's not the case. Some of them want east, and even some of them want the master bedroom in a certain way so they can have their bed and east or west. And north. There is a lot of in, in depth of uh, these uh, uh, clients. So if you, like Susie says, if you get involved with them, so you will start learning each other's uh, uh, requirements differently than you'll just go and label Indian. It would not work that way at all. One other thing on, uh, uh, as a whole, some of them uh, groups would give you referral and lead more than you even want. That kind of uh, uh, trust and, conf you know, if once you build up confidence with one person, as Susie mentioned, you will get referral. I am getting a referral from 30 years back. Uh, it's still they are sending their sons and their uncles or whoever coming in this country or someone is buying. I don't have to advertise myself because I'm already in, in, in a two to three major community. So you have to put your name in a major community and you most probably be a part. And I have seen my uh, fellow realtors did same thing with my community. You know, they have gone through and uh, they're getting a, I know a bunch of uh, South Indian, there is a group there, they will not go anywhere else but that realtor. So there is a lot of uh, trust and confidence building in, in uh, town. So uh, it is a... Yeah, to your question about the print, at least for my community, the Filipino community, we're a small community here in Austin, so I, I don't think it's, you know, um, one way to do it. But what we do actually is to leave our business cards in the different small stores, Filipino stores all over town. There's about four or five um, here in Austin and we leave our business cards in there. So locally, that's one way that we can generate leads. And then um, for the international um, buyers, um, become part of organizations that have international reach. For example, the Asian American uh, Asian Real Estate Association, or ARIA. We have um, networking across the nation. I have realtors from different cities contacting me and saying, hey, I have these people interested in Austin. Can you show them around? In fact, you know, one California realtor came with their Chinese clients in here. They didn't speak English, but the realtor spoke English, and so she was the one interpreting while I was showing them around. So um, ARIA also has trade missions in different countries. So in September, there's one in Bangalore, India. So if India is your target city, then go there. There's um, one in August for Thai, um, Thailand, Singapore, and I forgot the other one. But go to those countries, start those relationships. And again, it's a long process. You have to nurture that relationship until you get that trust. You're absolutely right. It's, uh, it, there's more than one, than one place and one way to get buyer leads from foreign countries. Uh, from the most basic, the most basic one would be a sign call. You have a listing. Somebody drives by or sees it online, well, nobody calls anymore. They, 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 everybody has their mobile application, so they end up sending you a text or a, or a, or a phone call. But yeah, you, do, you do still get some sign calls. From those are the, just the basic. The other ones that I have found that worked for me was when you start working with one particular foreign buyer and you've earned the respect and you earn their loyalty, you will be rewarded because they're going to send more buyers and more, more buyers to you. They're going to send their cousins, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, friends, neighbors. And before you know it, you're getting one or two referrals every three or four months from people who are moving in from that particular country into your, into your area. Trade shows is a good way of doing it. What did it for me? As soon as I got my CIPS designation, which is a great tool, by the way, 
and we're doing a class coming up soon here in, sem in September here in San Antonio. So if you don't have your CIPS designation, I encourage you to get it because that's certainly a great tool to find more buyers and, uh, and sellers too. But when I, when, right after I got my designation, I decided to focus on the country that I, uh, that I had, that I had of my choice, which was Mexico. I speak Spanish, I'm not Mexican, I'm Puerto Rican. But since I speak Spanish and Mexico's next door, it was just the natural thing to do. Plus I had some contacts from my previous uh, 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 jobs. So I found out that there was a trade show called Expocom Bienes Raices in the World Trade Center in Mexico City and I signed up for it, paid $30, bought a plane ticket, spent two nights in a hotel, and then start walking the floor in the trade show, handing on my business cards, meeting people, and building relationships. And, that's, and that was in 2004. And today, just about everybody who's involved in the Mexican real estate in many major cities know who I am, because I have been developing and building that relationship since 2004, that's 13 years. It takes a while, but it will give you, it will give you rewards because it'll give you buyers, it'll give you leads, it'll give you referrals. Build the relationships also with other real estate agents. You can, if, you pos if it's possible, become a member of that particular real estate association in the particular country that you're interested in. You might be able to become like an international me guest member or something like that. Go to their trade shows, go to their conventions, go to their congresses. Build those relationships with some of those real estate professionals in other countries because they have clients and they know people who are going to buy properties here in the United States, here in, in, in Austin, in, in your particular case, Austin. I've gotten business that way. So that's another source, Re signs, referrals, uh, trade shows, mostly referrals. So what's really striking about what you guys just went through, right, for me, from my standpoint, is how it's like international buyer lead gen is something out of like 1965. <laughs> like where's the internet? I mean, let's face it, like in the industry today, Zillow is like dominates conversation. Like we could have this entire panel go totally sideways if we start talking about Zillow. So we're not. But fact is like technology is such a big part of everyone's sort of awareness and in, in the, you know, in the consciousness what about technology? What about web? What about mobile? When we're talking about international customers, is there anything there? I don't, I don't see a lot. I mean, I, I, to tell you the truth, most foreign buyers end up calling you, or they're being they're referred by somebody that knows you, so they will call you, and they might be looking at some properties online. They they've got the ability to get into into the MLSs here in the United States or or consumer facing portals like. Zillow and Trulia and HR.com and all these other consumer facing portals and they can get in there and look at the properties but that's it. What else are they going to do? If they don't know the realtor, <coughs> they don't know the agent or the listing agent, they don't know the process, they're stuck. So that's when the referral comes in. You get a referral, the person who's looked at the property, he might even tell you, by the way, Richard, I saw this property on this, you know, this is the address. I, I'm going to be in Houston and I'd like to go take a look at the property. Okay. So yeah, they do. They use the technology, but only to do the searches. They they don't dig up any more information because they don't they don't know they don't know how or what Jay? to search for. Yeah, in most in Indian community, just to give you an example, there are two type of uh, uh, foreign buyers, even internally as well as out out of country. There is a trade who does not have a no technology information at all, they just trade people. So they wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with you versus then you have a high-tech professional who just don't want to even talk to you but talk to you by email or, or by web, whatever you are uh, conducting. So there are two type of, uh, in my community, buyers are there. And uh, lead generation standpoint, there is where you concentrate that it, do you want to work with a professional side of people or do you want to work with a uh, trade side of people? Trade side of people, you are spending different time than uh, uh, working with the professionals. Professionals have all high techs. They are all, you know, H1 guys type of people. They know how to get 
all the data. They know Google's, they know the Gilgos, they know everything. So you got a, a different audience there. So if you are talking about Gilo, you're gonna have to explain it what is the real, real, you cannot say Gilo has this problem, that problem. They're gonna ask you detail from even sitting in Bombay and then say, hey, what is uh, things? So there are two type of people you are looking at there and it is a uh, high tech in, in that sense. Technology has helped us so much to deal with foreign, foreign uh, transactions. In my case, there's a free uh, chatting called Katok. Um, all Koreans have um, used that, also using it. Um, it's, it's a free voice talk, it's a free conversations, also free chatting. You can send a thousand pictures at a time. It, it's just not a problem. So I ended up talking to them through Katok for free. In old days, we have to pay for telephone bills for the international. That's quite uh, you know pricey, but nowadays, Technology has helped us so much to communicate with them. No matter where they are, I can still communicate as long as we don't have a time, you know, time differences too much. Um, also, Realtor.com, Zillow, as we all know, even though we can deny them, those big dogs, the, the clients, foreign clients, they already search it through Google or Realtor.com or Zillow to find out who they are, what they are, what they've been doing before even they contact you, even though you are foreign, even though you don't speak a language. Somehow they find you, they will search it for who you are and then contact you. By the time when they contact you, they will not ask you what your background is. They already search it, digging every information. So they may not speak English very well, but they know how to search them, you know, find all sorts of stuff. Korea has been one of a very high tech uh, country even elementary school kids carry their cell phones to know how to use that, play games and stuff. So it's, it's very tech savvy. Um, then when you wanna deal with those people, of course, you have to posting a lot of information in online as well about what you've been doing or what kind of articles, the information that you do. So using technology, life has been very easy for us to deal with those foreign. Therefore, you can do any transactions, even though you are sitting in Bahamas, you know, having vacations, you can still use your smartphone to do the transactions. You don't have to be physically in Austin or even that country to do the transactions. So take advantage of technology. There are a lot of apps that you can even use for taking photos or even scan the document through it. And title company definitely helps you, even though you're in different country, you wanna get the information that you don't have it with you, then you contact the title company, they will send you that information to your client directly. Sometimes banks also, if, if you don't know how to speak their language, bank or title company has interpreter and then, and then they will assign those people to work with you. So, um, uh, technology. Technology. I'm thinking technology. Yeah, so I'm sure um, a lot of brokerages get some leads from international buyers from their websites. I don't know the number. Um, I'm guessing maybe randomly here and there. Uh, but I look at the internet as complementary to the building the relationship. Um, we use it to whet the appetite for the property. I know that there are certain brokerages um, they've presented in some of our events, our events, where they've developed materials specifically targeting um, particular buyers, for example, the Chinese buyers. For example, San Diego, a, um, a, a Sotheby's um, company in San Diego, they go to China and they have materials, printed materials, that basically show a map of California, but the center of California is San Diego. <laughs> and so they bring that. So aside from that, we know that Sotheby's has a good presence in the internet as well. So they go there, show them the materials, and they point them to the internet. So it's all complementary but it's not the end-all, be-all marketing device. Uh, all right, so moving on, 
chances are, let's be honest, chances are most of the people in this room who are not already involved one way or another, who aren't a minority, aren't necessarily going to go start uh, flying to conferences in, in Korea to try and, you know, Again. get leads. It's probably not going to happen. What is far more likely to happen is that they will be on the other side of a transaction with you or people who are doing it where the buyer or the seller is an international buyer, what have you. What is the message, and I'm just going to go from Jade down this way, what is the number one most important thing that a, a realtor who's not necessarily in this side knows what's going on, needs to know when working with you and one of your international buyers? That's a really good question. Uh, I've been going through this for years. As you all know, my 30-year experience, uh, I have worked with the builders on this case. Builders are very, 20 years ago builders were not knowledgeable of Asian or, or any international buyers as well as today's day. Today's day, they are ready. They are dealing because they, even in some cases, I know big, bigger companies in Austin have called me up and say, hey, Jay, I need your help to translate this for me for only just to that. And that referral was kind of a, a short leave, but it's just like making them comfortable that you are with that, you are working with a agent who is a really well-known and a recognized agent. So those kind of things giving them uh, other realtors, uh, going back with uh, uh, other realtors, sometimes they get frustrated because you are working with a, a client who has uh, cultural pace versus uh, you're working with other guy, let's hop it, and let's finish it, let's go. And that is your but one week or two week negotiating period is very critical because your buyers are very meticulous on a certain things, certain ways and all that. They don't even sometimes know about inspection things. You know, uh, inspection things is a really, really key. And they don't know how to negotiate, so you have to work with the other realtor explaining them. I usually educate them very beginning. If I'm going to put a contract with uh, other agents, with my buyer, I will give my buyer's complete profile. Hey, here is this guy. They're not going to move this way. They're not going to do this. So they know exactly where, what to expect in next step. And same thing I would do with my buyers. So, hey, this realtor is not going to like me. They are different. They're going to be looking certain different ways. So what I'm helping you out and what I'm carrying you, they're not carrying. And even in this market right now, some of them uh, clients wants to have an offer. I say, forget offer. Talk about multiple offer. So, you know, if you're ready to go out and put uh, 20000 more on one thing, so those kind of things, working with other realtor is educating other realtor of your style of your buyers. Because your style of your buyer is going to help other realtor to, not in negotiating side, I'm talking about uh, understanding the process. Process is the things they don't sometimes understand that, hey, why do I have to do in seven days inspection? Uh, why do I have to do uh, certain things, appraisal, I have to pay for it? They don't have that concept that much sometimes. So you have to really, really get in, uh, educate other realtors, and you have to be a patient with them. That's that's bottom line. Be prepared for very meticulous buyers. Um, some buyers have their own um, lawyers aside from us, realtors representing them, and those attorneys from other states will cross out certain things in our um, contract. So just be prepared for that. Susie, what do they need to know when working with you and an international buyer on the other side? When you get out of judgment, just open with the curiosity, things will open to your door. They speak, they talk like a dog, they walk like a dog, and swim like a dog, then you become a dog in a dog pond. So <laughs> it's, it's, it, so even though they speak English with an accent, you just, you just act like you're one of their dogs. And then guess what? They will understand. They will laugh at you, and then they'll work with you. However, some foreign clients are very demanding, very demanding with the little things. So I became like 
hey, Suzy is one of the best realtor in Austin among you know, non-foreign clients, then I become, you're the worst realtor in Korean, you know. Can you give me an example? Community. Like what happened? So what what is this it's demanding? A, it's a such demanding, also it's such expecting, no matter how well you do, they always find something to pick on. It's, that's the culture that we grow up. Uh, good example of me, I'm the baby. I'm, yeah, yes. I'm the baby of the sister, uh, my family. When I go visit there, I've been living more than half of my life in the United States. I know I talk like a duck in American ponds, right? <laughs> and, and, uh, but they still think of me as a Korean, right? So I said, your hair's too long, your hair's too curly, let's go to beauty salon, change it. Your clothes is not well uh, suited. They still pick on me for that. I said, sister, please look at me something good about me other than picking on something. So it's their culture. That does not mean you don't do well. They just want to do everything perfect. There's nothing in this world called perfect, but they think there's something what they're looking for is that. Um, even though you make a mistake, you admit it, you be humble, you, you put your head down, you know, I'm sorry, I'll do better. And guess what, it's okay, instead of putting your head up. So being humble is always good way of handling it. Um, sometimes I have to chew my tongue so many times. Should I say, should I not, or should I say, should I not? Okay, just keep my, my mouth shut, and then just listen to their lectures as if they are doing better than me uh, as my profession. So I listened to for 20 minutes, and I got all worn out my energy, and then I have to go to shopping instead of going back to the office. <laughs> uh, I have a feeling a lot of Korean clients are getting referred your way, Susie. Now that after this uh, nightmare, they're gonna be like, I don't want those Koreans as clients, hell with that. <laughs> but it's so funny though, when they work with the non-Korean realtors, they don't do that. <laughs> So grab the, those Korean real, I mean Korean investors. I mean they will do very cordial to you. They're they're not gonna demand the Korean way, right? So you get to know them. Guess what? Generating, they will continue refer you. There are many Samsung engineers coming to Austin, and even though they don't buy their own houses, but sometimes they buy through their family members or for their kids and then kids can stay here and the husband go, you know, goes back to Korea. So there are many Koreans here, that's about over 10,000 plus UT, UT graduate students, so. All right, Richard, your, your question and answer, we're gonna take a break right after you're done. When, first of all, let me say that there are good real estate agents and bad real estate agents in every community, in every city, in every country, there's the ones that will watch out for the country, for the client's interests, and the ones that all worry about is their commission. And that happens everywhere. I work with real estate agents in other countries that I learn to understand that they're professionals, that they care about their client's best interests. So when I'm dealing with these colleagues in these other countries that whom I respect tremendously because they manage to do a substantially well, good job, without not even a fraction of the tools that we have here. So when I'm working these relationships with some of my colleagues in these other countries, they self-discover that my values and their values are very similar. Watch out for the client's interest, that's numero uno. So those are the ones that start referring clients to me. The ones who don't have that belief or the ones who don't share it, I, I, don't, ming I don't mingle with them, I don't deal with them. I, I see through them and they, 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 I just brush them aside, then go find the ones that have similar values that I do. And that's how I do it with my, some of my colleagues from other countries, uh, several countries in fact, not just one specific one. All right, I think uh, as I promised, we'll just take a quick five minute break, use a restroom, make phone, return phone calls, what have you. We're going to start back again at 11.20 precisely, thank you.
right. Let's start getting back. All right, everyone. Let us start making our way back to our chairs. I need my well-spoken panelists to start making their way back. Everyone back, come on back. Okay, right, everyone. take your seats. Take, take your, your seats. seats, please. I'm missing two panelists. Speaking of cultural differences. <laughs> When you hunt down Richard and Rella. Huh? Hunt down Richard and Rella. There's Rella. Woohoo! Now we need Richard. Oops, sorry. I think it's gone so far. All right. I know. Take your seats. Take your seats. <laughs> Take my whole life through. Who is singing? Me. <laughs> and I still need Richard. Richard, all right. Yes, sir. This is a this is the toughest part to getting back to I them. Know. <laughs> but I felt like we needed. No, no, you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, you just okay. All right. We're going to start back up because I would like to leave some time at the end of this for you guys to be able to ask questions instead of it just being me. Richard has been eaten by a lion, but we are trying to re rescue him, so we'll get him back as soon as uh, we pry him out. So um, I've also been informed that I have the power and authority to cut your microphones off. So you know we're going to try and keep this moving. Uh, we talked a bunch about sort of lead gen, you know, getting into the community, the transaction self title, and I think there's some really great thoughts there. There he is. Welcome back, Richard. Um, the next question, but you know, the assumption, the popular assumption, is that these international buyers are, you know, wealthy Chinese billionaires bringing, you know, bags of cash. But that's not necessarily true. I mean, the stats are showing something like 42, 43 percent of international buyers get a mortgage. Can you talk a little bit about the, the challenges 
and what's, what some of the, some of the uh, attendees might need to know about when working with international buyers, or sellers for that matter, and mortgage, the mortgage side of things. Maybe we'll start with Richard and go that way, and I will cut you off. Well, so. there's, there's several mortgage companies in, in Houston, and I'm sure you find one here or two in Austin, that do provide mortgages to foreign nationals. <laughs> they have a different set of uh, criteria. For example, a 30% down as opposed to only three and a half or FHAs and things like that. And because a lot of these countries don't have a credit reporting bureaus, they ask the seller or the buyer, excuse me, to provide three reference letters, for example, from three trade references that they may be having uh, payments, installment payments on. And they also have to provide, obviously, the banks in these cases always require uh, verification of funds or income. So that's typically the biggest thing that these uh, mortgage companies will require. And most of these foreign buyers that have the money, they would rather use somebody else's money rather than having to fork over 400, 500, or 600 thousand dollars on their own. I've got a guy who's, who's extremely wealthy, but he doesn't want to use his money, so he goes gets a loan. He gets a commercial loan to buy some commercial property. He pays 50% down, but get what? He keeps the other 50% and puts it in some sort of other investment. And then he pays off that, that, that note, that 10 year note. He pays it off in three years. So a lot of the foreign buyers that are doing that, they're smart. They're not doing it because they don't have the money. They're doing it because they don't want to use all of their money. Most of buyers, foreign buyers pay cash but when you deal with mortgages, sometimes they offer their own home country loan, and if so, those money can be wired directly to, to the title company, so the money doesn't have to come in a personal account. If it comes to personal account, it will be a hassle with the IRS dealing with. So it's, it's, it's best way of handling is talk with your client how the money should be wired through title company, those information should get out first. Great. And then there are those recently, um, recent people who immigrated in here who don't have any kind of credit scores, but they pay good grant. Um, all their utilities are paid well. And I know some of the big banks are able to do some kind of alternative credit um, thing so that they can um, loan to them. But um, I hope that more lenders are able to do that so that you can get more of this business. Aside from that too, specifically from my country, um, a particular group are nurses. And the nurses are usually the women and the men are the stay-at-home dads who take care of the children. It is very important um, for Western lenders that when they look at the income that they're <coughs> sensitive that the man is not earning money. Because if you make comments about, you know, the man not earning money, then it can be very, um, they, they are hurt because they're men, they're supposed to be the breadwinners, and they know that in this country, they're not, and they're staying at home. So just be careful about that. Uh, there are so many banks, big banks have uh, branches of international loans, and they are particularly Wells Fargo, if I remember correctly, recently I worked with them, and they have a certain uh, criteria you have to meet in order to get the foreign buyers to buy uh, loan here. I mean, mortgage, as well as H1 has a different uh, set of uh, rules for the uh, buyers, because H1 is working here, but they don't have a credit build up yet. So you work, you know, towards that, and they have a different criteria. Those no docs are gone so long, but still there are exists somewhere, and uh, people are still buying. Private lenders are coming in and trying to pull in uh, some money for uh, foreign buyers. So there are so many ways you could give. National Association of Realtors have a, uh, a site where you go and uh, look for all these kind of uh, details of uh, how to get foreign buyers a uh, mortgage. So if you go to NAR's uh, site, international site, that will help you a lot to understand. I'm actually really glad you brought up NAR because that's where we're sort of headed next. Um, 
NAR has, Christine, 69, 69 bilateral agreements with realtor associates of other, other countries. 84? 84. Okay, it's gone up. So 84. Talk, talk to a little about, I guess we'll start with NAR. I mean, do those help, those bilateral agreements? I mean, what's the impact that it has on the business of realtors here? Jay. That bilateral agreement basically tells and makes uh, you both realtors here in that country that you are protected for your uh, service fees. That really helps a lot in, in just like as you know, our MLS system, we have agreement with each broker that we are agreeing to uh, contribute to each other's uh, services. So same similar situation for this bilateral agreement. It is a really helpful for the documentation standpoint. It helps you to countries understanding that uh, U.S. requirement is a little different than what their country, like in U uh, India, as I mentioned before, that there is a different documentation requirement versus here. Uh, that same realtor in India can just walk in and sell it home internally there, where here they have to fill out so many uh, documents to understand the seller and buyers. Uh, so how does the bilateral agreement help that? I don't... That, in a way, you know, what NAR has done is that tell that country that you're going to have to manage, uh, I mean, understand our document, uh, what okay. we have, versus their document. You know, Got it. we are taking, if we are selling uh, housing, I mean, property in uh, that country, then we have to follow their uh, uh, requirements on top of it, some of the country don't have even title policy, title insurance, that uh, kind of uh, uh, gives them a little more uh, confidence in me. So Susie, I mean, that's NAR, since you're an ABOR board member as well. What more could ABOR or Actress, the MLS, do? Is there anything that you wish that the association of the MLS had to make international transactions easier, more fluid, more common? Any thoughts? Well, Realtor.com or Zillow, most of our foreign uh, consumers looking for those sites to search for the properties. So we MLS, I think, you know, we're doing a great job for in terms of, uh, you know, providing those informations. However, um, if foreign um, consumers are looking for they are language speaking realtors. We don't have that information currently. Um, actually, we do have it, able.com slash international. When you go there searching for their language speaker, and, and you may be able to find it. Um, however, um, it's, it, it's somehow it's challenging for them just to searching for properties in our MLS because we are locally known MLS. So. Uh, most of them searching for Zillow or Realtor.com to get the information done. So I tell them that, look, we we are, we as realtors sending information is the most accurate one other than Zillow or Realtor.com. Rich, what about Texas? Is there anything you feel like Texas, so seeing as Mike is here, is there anything those guys can do to help facilitate international? Well, the TAR Association, TAR, Texas Association of Realtors, has already done extensive work in the international side, specifically in Mexico, for two reasons. One of them, because Mexico is nearby, and the second one is because TAR is the ambassador association for NAR to Mexico. And uh, TAR has done trade missions to Guadalajara back in 06, 07, if I believe, and they have, which was very successful. There was about, uh, I don't know, a substantial large amount of uh, real estate agents from Texas went to Guadalajara and they spent three and a half days uh, building relationships with real estate practitioners in Guadalajara and some of them came back with good leads and some of them came back with, with listings, with businesses. And, and so so they, they benefited from that. The other one that, would, that TAR has been doing consecutively now for six years in a row is the TAR International Cruise, selling out of Galveston. And unfortunately, because of the 
geographics, those cruises always end up going to one of five places. So they go to Cozumel, Grand Cayman, Jamaica, Montego Bay, or Belize. Those are the only five choices that, that TAR has in terms of the cruise ships because all three lines that sailing out of Galveston or Houston go to the same locations. But that gives the, last year where there was like almost 200 realtors in, in, in the cruise, and some of you were, I remember you from last year, and the previous years, we, we started this is 19, in 2012, and every year that it grows up a little bit more, that we go, these realtors, we, because as the, uh, the event has been sponsored and organized by TAR, they, they get to go to these cities, they get to go to these countries, build relationships, they go visit properties, we do some property tours, we understand how some of the Jamaicans and how the Caymanians and uh, in Mexico, how the AMPI con conducts their, their real estate transactions. So that's what TR has been doing for us. I mean, Mike. Very active in, in promoting the international relationship between the, the Texas realtors and Mexico practitioners. Mike, if, if you need a moderator for this cruise uh, that might be coming up, I just want you to remember. You know. Anyway. Um, all right, so again, because I want to leave some time for q and like, there's there are a couple topics, and I'll just sort of classify them as uh, ugly and problematic topics, but stuff we have to discuss anyway. The number one on the list is the fact that there's a lot of, a lot of suspicion, a lot of feeling that international money, especially Asian money, is distorting the housing market, and it's really driving the affordability crisis. Now, we know this is true in Vancouver. We know this is true in San Francisco. What about Austin? Do you guys feel like the international money is making the affordability issue worse? And from California, those damn international. <laughs> Californian buyers are making this area a little tougher for us, our market price. So it's not international money, it's, it's California not, money. Not okay. international money, it's Californian money. And it first, is foreign. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for us it is foreign. And uh, that is uh, what it is big uh, uh, bump in. Builders are enjoying that. Builder is the most <laughs> who enjoys right. this uh, appreciation from uh, Californian buyers. But Richard, you're, in your opening sort of thing, you mentioned that the average international buyer it's $150,000 more. Yeah. I mean, so it feels like it has an impact on affordability. What do, what do you think? No, what do you say? buy a different property. Yeah. They don't buy a $300,000 property. They buy a $450,000 yeah. property. That has nothing to do with affordability. Yeah. None. Yeah. I think the local buyers are very competitive compared yeah. to, you know, the international buyers for the same property. Yeah. In Chinese investors' point of view, Austin is not the, their number one choices. California is, so they're, pour, they're pouring the money. They don't care what properties they are, they just buy the properties just to get the money out of the country. So luckily we haven't had that kind of situations by Chinese investors here in Austin. All right, and secondly, talk about hot topic, third rail stuff, but what about buying or selling when you're working with a client who might be undocumented? Does that come up, or how do you deal with that if it does? Yes, Richard. That has happened to me. Oh, it's happened. Okay, talk to us about that. We lost the transaction because the husband had been deported, and the wife was here in Texas illegally. And when we got to the point that uh, the title company requested identif identification from the seller, the lady, the wife, she couldn't produce it. She didn't even have a legal, her passport, from Mexico had expired, her consular ID had expired, and she didn't have a valid driver's license. She had no proof other than a photograph on a Visa debit card. And we, we, we weren't, the title company was not able to close the transaction. So that will have an impact on the transaction. And having one of the sellers undocumented, un unable to, pr to verify his or her identity. Anybody else? In my community, I don't have that much a problem because they find a way to get someone else to buy for them and leave. Oh, straw purchasers. That's right. That's <laughs> so, 
So indirectly, That's... indirectly, that is not an uh, issue. They are a little smarter in that way. <laughs> yeah. Is there an attorney in the room? <laughs> 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 and, and I'm perhaps too new to have handled those kind of, you know, transactions. I have not. And, you know, and related to that, again, this is not a partisan form by any stretch, but I know speaking to friends in California, for example, they mentioned that the recent policies of this administration regarding immigration issues has discouraged international buyers, suppressed this somewhat. Are you guys seeing anything like that? Yes, Richard. Not yet. There, I was in Mexico in February for the installation of the new president. We, we got bombarded with that. I mean, it was a fact of life. The Mexicans resented the, uh, the, the, the political environment that, that has been created in the recent months, and, and they started bombarding us with that. And I went as a representative of NAR, as a PL. We had two of the high exec, we had two of the leadership of the NAR there, uh, John Smavey and, um, and Chris Pollockron were there too. And we're, we're thinking, why are these guys bombarding us? And they were annoyed and they were resentful. So we tried to pacify them as best as we could, telling them, look guys, we're here to build fence, to build bridges, not to build walls. We're here, we're here to build, build bridges, not build walls. So they got a little bit happy about that. But the bottom line is that we haven't seen any negative effect yet at this point, and I think because the Mexican market that comes, the Mexican buyers that are coming into the U.S. are driven not so much by politics here, but politics over there. Mm -hmm. And elections are coming up, and the current environment in Mexico is very unstable because they don't like the current president, and nobody respects the guy, so if they, they most, most politicians and most people in, in, in Mexico believe that there's a good, strong opportunity that the, the socialist candidate might win the elections. And when that happened 14 years ago, we ended up getting a ton of buyers that were buying properties here in the U.S. That could happen again. And it has nothing to do with the politics in the U.S. It has everything to do with the politics in their home country. Some Koreans do form the paper companies, and then they buy properties through paper companies. I don't want to discuss any further about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's very so, sensitive. I think one of the main takeaways there is that NAR, one of the things that NAR could do to help the realtors international business is to encourage socialist candidates for president in other countries. <laughs> If you can have a word with our new State Department. Uh, <laughs> all right, so I think, I, like I said, I really wanted to leave some time open. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I will try and bring a microphone. Oh, and there's another one floating this way. And uh, let's try and keep the question and the answer as short as possible so we get to as many questions as possible. Hi, Jay. Um, can you talk to everyone about auspicious days as it relates to a closing date? There are a lot of them. <laughs> as, as you notice that uh, I was talking to my wife the other day, and she had a Hindu calendar. And it has, if you go in a month, you've got four or five auspicious days. And it depends on, uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, timing-wise, they call a Vastu. And in, in there, certain time, they will close on certain days. Uh, it's 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 a really important for a lot of Hindu, and that's a really religious things. And sometimes builders and sometimes uh, other realtor and seller do not understand why they had to do it. It's just it's a phony, and that kind of a word I hear from other realtors. Again, go back to realtors training. That's where basically you know it's a it's a it's a really challenge for the a lot of realtors and sellers. This is uh, more for. Richard and then Susie, since she's a neighbor, but on the buying side, side, I have helped people buy properties over here from Mexico, but then they tell me they have properties over there they want to sell. So is there anything other than a referral that I can personally go over there and take care of it as from the ABOR side? And then on the ABOR side, if I have properties in Costa Rica and Belize and other countries and even across the pond, can I market that with ABOR? 
somehow. Talk to your broker first. <laughs> if your broker allows it and he, he, he or she blesses it, yes, you could market the properties. In fact, you could become a listing agent. Make sure that you comply with your MLS rules. And if they're not, if they're same as, as at Houston, for example, the MLS rules requires that you have an exclusive rights to sell. Many foreign sellers are unwilling to do exclusive rights to sell because they're afraid of they're going to get limited. So that's one thing you have to deal with. But be very careful because we had so much abuse in Houston about people putting properties on our Area 82, which is an international area, that we have started enforcing it now. As effective as next month, we are going to ask for any real estate agent who has a listing on Area 82 and an international listing, they need to, within five days, submit a copy of their exclusive rights to sell listing agreement. It doesn't have to be a TAR promulgated form. It could be an exclusive rights to sell written by an attorney or written by somebody else, as long as it complies with the minimum requirements. But the answer to your question is, yes, you can do it, provided that your broker will allow you and you meet the MLS rules you can, you can actually post a property on your international section if you have one here in Austin. If not, then you can become a member of HAR uh, or uh, uh, the, the Metrotex office also has a, they just started uh, a new section in the international section that the Dallas Metrotex uh, Board of Realtors did. So you can actually, once you take the property, and I'll give you an example of what I did. In Puerto Rico, I took a listing. We signed the exclusive rights to sale. I could not post a sign in that property in Puerto Rico because I'm not allowed to practice real estate in Puerto Rico because you've got to be licensed over there. So I hired and I wrote a co-broker agreement with a licensed broker in Puerto Rico. And she's the one that posted the sign. She's the one that posted it on her website down there. And she's the one that ultimately found the buyer. So we ended up splitting the commission just as we had agreed on the, on the, on the referral, on the co-broker agreement. So you can do that also. We international committee at the ABO is in talks about this kind of situations and also posting some foreign properties in our site, but it is underway. So I would suggest you get involved in international committee, sign up this, this year for next year. Also getting CIPS designation will open the door for you how to deal with those foreign uh, transactions right, with the properties. Question right here. Hi, um, first thing's a comment, I guess, for Richard a little bit about the extra time that you take with people in the beginning. And I kind of think that that is a reminder of our similarities and not our differences because I think it's true of all transactions. If we take a little bit more time in the beginning with people to see the things that we know that are going to come our way. So it's a great comment, but we should all kind of heed that. But I think my question more is how do you handle respecting a culture, if you will, whether it's feng shui or it's religious artifacts or it's very heavy furniture, things like that, and try to, I mean, we, we know this because I do see sometimes when I see home sell, I feel that the seller was very disadvantaged by their realtor who didn't have those hard conversations with them. And I understand we need to respect where people are coming from, but the market is the market. And, um, you know, if you don't tell them that the cooking odor is very strong in the house, you're doing them a disservice, and that that's money and tens of thousands of dollars. And I've been called in to fix those a lot, and it's great for me. So keep them coming, but um, but it's it's real. So how do you handle those conversations of respect the way you did that here? But here's where we are now. Very diplomatically, very carefully. I went to see a seller in my own neighborhood. Uh, it was an expired listing, and. I, the minute I walked into the house, I realized that I knew why it had expired. It was somebody from India, and they have a different concept of decoration, smells along the house, and they had a shrine for their for their, their deity in one of the bedrooms, and it was at, it looked like a like a religious room, and it was important to them. And I mentioned to him that. We want to make sure that the property is attractive to the majority of buyers as opposed to just a very small group. And I try to be as diplomatic as possible, explaining to him that you want to make the house as universally acceptable as possible. But he was adamant about that. He said, I'm not going to take down my shrine. And he says, okay, fine. And that was it. I, I did not get the listing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I Which have is a question. 
I have a question regarding power of attorney. I have a client in India, and same thing, it was going to take them a long time. They asked me if I could do the power of attorney for them, which I have done before for clients, and I talked to the title company, and they said I could not um, sign off on a power of attorney for my clients because there was now a financial interest on my part. So how would, who do you go to if they don't have family members or something like that? Attorney would be good. They, you know, they will be. There will be attorneys who handle that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Attorneys are never free. You know. <laughs> and, and also, title company has a lot of uh, information regarding uh, how to handle uh, power of attorney in a lot of uh, fields. Yes, hello. I'm Mark Minchu. I have a CIPS and an IRES, and about a fourth of my business is international. And every once in a while you have an epiphany, so I just wanted to share mine with you very quickly. I deal a lot with the local younger portion of the international buyer. But when I meet their parents, it's different. You have to realize the, um, the culture, many people, especially youngers that live here, they don't observe the same customs as do their parents. So you need to know the different cultural differences when you meet their parents, even though you've been dealing with them a lot here, there's a big change when their parents come in. It woke me up. <laughs> Great advice. <laughs> Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Yes, sir. Um, I kind of want to make a comment. I'm a lender that does offer mortgages for international buyers. And the thing that you really have to keep in mind is that you have to document those loans the same as you would here, except with foreign documents that are translated. So it often does take quite a bit of time to get the necessary documentation, because we do have to have two years of income verification, last couple of months of bank statements. They do have to have a valid visa. I mean, that can be a visitor visa, but I get asked a lot if we'll do I-10 lending, which is people that are here without a valid visa, we don't offer it, and I don't know of any bank that does. But just so that you're aware, you know, you basically have to document everything the same as you would someone here. It just has to be with the foreign documents, and they have to be translated, and sometimes those are hard to get and take time. I've done a number of engineers from China, and the banking system is different there, the tax system is different there, and it just takes time to collect all those documents. So you have to be aware of that and kind of have everyone work as a team as opposed to kind of accusing each other on things. So that's just my comment. All right. Um, seeing no more hands in the air, I think it would be a great time to thank our panelists for their wis participation wisdom. And we're going to end early. Amazing. So thank you all for the opportunity. It's been great. I know, even with the break, I wanted to especially thank Rob, our, our moderator, and I know we've already thanked the panelists. I think what's important before you head out today, there was a lot of valuable information. Your, the Austin Board of Realtors will be having the CIPS designation course, so if you're interested in this field and you want to get that designation, it's going to be September 18th through the 22nd, and Richard Miranda will actually be the instructor. Um, I know. So thank you guys, and we will be bringing more information like this to you as it comes next month. Thank you. Have a great day. There's a great mission.